Welcome. I want to draw your attention to the activity that you are engaged in right now. As it happens, sound waves are coming out of your computer or your headphones that are associated with my voice. Those sound waves are hitting your eardrums. They're causing that lovely process of mechanical transduction that we talked about a few class periods ago that are ultimately resulting in action potentials being sent up the auditory nerve into your brain. And somehow, somehow that is leading you to have ideas and think thoughts. Now, this may not seem like an incredible process, but when you break it down into its components, what's happening is that, you see, I I've got this hole in the bottom half of my face, and by flapping my mouth meat around in a particular configuration, I'm leading to a series of events that make you have ideas. This, this is like a, a form of remote mind control. I can make you think thoughts just by flapping my mouth meat around. So this is what we're tackling today. I think this is one of the most fascinating processes in the world. Did I say one of the most? I think this is the most fascinating process in the world. Today we're talking about understanding spoken language. And this is really near and dear to my heart because this is what I do research on in my lab. Okay, I'm gonna play you a voicemail that my friend Aaron left for my friend David. I want you to listen closely and try to determine what Aaron said. Hey David, one more thing that I noticed about figure one where you first show the cumulative degree distributions for the different measures. All right, now here's the text of how Google Voice transcribed that. Now, listen again. Hey David, one more thing that I noticed about figure one where you first show the cumulative degree distributions for the different measures. So Google Voice did okay on some of the words and totally messed up others. So one of the clues that we have that understanding speech is actually complicated and difficult is that it's much harder for computers to do it than for, for humans. So why does speech perception pose a particular challenge? Why, what's hard about it? Well, what I, what I hope to convince you is that recognizing speech is such a mammothly complicated cognitive and perceptual task that it shouldn't be surprising that it's hard for computers. It should be surprising that it's easy for us. So what makes recognizing spoken words hard? Well, to begin with, our mental dictionaries, our mental lexicons, uh, are estimated to have something like 60,000 words. Words are certainly the only thing that you know 60,000 of, right? You don't know 60,000 people, you haven't seen 60,000 movies. The only thing that there are 60,000 units of in your brain is words. So when you hear a particular individual word, what you need to do is identify what that signal corresponds to in your mental lexicon. You have to search 60,000 entries to figure out which one you've actually heard. Now, that's already a challenging task, but what makes it even harder is that many of the speech sounds, many of the individual units that we can hear are very similar to one another. So this is a spectrogram showing someone saying to and do. And what you may notice is that the spectrograms look really similar to one another. The only difference is that region that's shaded in, in red. Right at the beginning, there's a timing difference in to and do of about 70 milliseconds. If you put your fingers on your throat, actually do this, put your fingers on your throat and say, to do, to do. What you may notice is the time between when you start to say t and your vocal cords start to vibrate is much longer for to than for do. Try it again, to do, to do. And that timing difference is, like I said, about, about 70 milliseconds. So when you're distinguishing between the words to and do, what you're listening for is a 70 millisecond difference between when that initial uh, articulation happens and when the vocal cords start to vibrate. We call that the voice onset time. We're gonna talk about that again in a bit. So we're trying to distinguish between 60,000 units and many of them sound just a tiny bit different. Depending on how you count them, English has 40 something phonemes. So you might think, well, but if there's just 47 phonemes we have to distinguish between, uh, it's not that complicated, even if some of them sound similar, but, but, but here's a twist. Each phoneme is gonna sound different depending on the context that it's in. Phonemes are not just like neat little beads on a string all lined up one after the other. In fact, the way a particular phoneme or speech sound sounds depends on the speech sounds that come immediately before or after it. This phenomenon is called co-articulation. So, so here's a waveform representing bag and big. If phonemes were like beads on a string, separate and distinct, we should be able to isolate a particular chunk of that speech waveform that just sounds like b, right? There's gonna be a b part and an a part and a g part for bag. So let's listen to just this first chunk of bag. 
even very early, you can still hear what vowel is present. So compare this to what the beginning of big sounds like. Big. Big. So you can already tell them apart at that point. So you say, okay, well, let's just, let's just move it a little bit earlier. So now we're only hearing the very, very beginning. Surely that's just going to be buh. So even at the earliest moments of word onset, you can already tell what the vowel is going to be. So that means that the sound b differs depending on the vowel that, that follows it. So you think you are hearing the same sound in both those cases. You think you're hearing a b phoneme, but that's actually a function of the way that your brain is perceptually organizing the information because the b and the b don't have that much in common. In fact, speech without co-articulation is very difficult to understand. Here's a clip of some synthesized speech that was digitized to not include any co-articulation. So listen up and see if you can determine what he's saying. We the people of the United States in order to form an perfect union. All right, I'll give you some top-down information to help you parse that. It's the preamble of the Constitution. We the people of the United States. We the people of the United States in order to form an perfect so probably before you had that top-down information, it was very difficult to understand, right? But that is actually what speech would sound like if we didn't have any co-articulation. Okay, so we know lots of words, phonemes can sound very similar to one another, and phonemes sound different depending on their context. But let's make it even harder. Speech sounds different depending on lots of factors related to the talker. So when we're trying to decipher speech, we have to deal with the fact that words sound different from different people. I'm going to play you an example that shows how different speech can sound depending on who the talker is. Um, please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six pounds of fresh snow peas. Five thick slabs of blue cheese. And maybe a snack for her brother Bob. So the way that a particular utterance sounds is going to depend on the pitch that someone is saying it in. Female voices typically are higher pitched than male voices, for instance, but there's a lot of variability even within gender. Words sound different depending on the accent that they're spoken in, uh, the, the particular words that people choose, how quickly they say them, the intonation they use, and, and so forth. So when you hear a Minnesotan say, beg, you have to parse our wonderful vowels and understand that that's the same vowel as a non-Minnesotan saying, bag, even though they sound very, very different. Now, even within a talker, speech can be highly variable. So here are just a few of the ways that my kids can say mama. Mama! Mama. Mama, 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 mama. Mama. Mama, mama. 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 So somehow, I have to figure out that all of those things map onto the same representation in my mental lexicon. So to demonstrate just how much these differences within a talker can affect speech perception, I'm going to play you two different sentences, and I want you to listen closely and try and determine what the final word of the sentence is. On this trial, the word is gab. On this trial, the word is gab. All right, so in controlled lab settings, participants are more likely to report that first one was gab and the second one was gap. In fact, that was the exact same recording that you heard at the end of speech that was either presented quickly or slowly. It was the same word. But the context that preceded the word affects participants' perception of that final word. So, so here's why. Gab normally has a shorter voice onset time than gap. This is like the, top, the to do demo that we did earlier. So when I give you a word that is in between gap and gab, so we have deliberately chosen or synthesized uh, a sound that is not quite buh like and not quite puh like. So we interpret that as gab when the preceding context is very fast, and we interpret it as gap when the context is, is slow. So what I've talked about so far is how we identify phonemes from the speech signal and the challenges associated with that. But we also need to figure out how we take phonemes and combine them together into words. Now you might think, well, easy, we just like parse out the phonemes and once we've identified what the phonemes are, we line them all up and boom, there's a word. But here's why that's tricky. Although it seems like you're hearing my words individually right now with nice little breaks in between them. In fact, splitting words into discrete units is something that, that our mind does because it isn't present in the stimuli. In fact, silences are as likely to come within words as they are to come between words. So this is a waveform of someone saying 
we don't pause between words when we speak. And what you'll notice is that the points of silence, the kind of dead spots where there's no speech, often fall within a word rather than between words. So this is very different from reading words, where we have demarcations or spaces between every word and periods at the end of sentences. In speech, it's all happening very rapidly without any clear indications of where the boundaries are. That was a boundary. Another difference from reading words is that once words have been spoken, they're gone. When you're reading, you can skip back, review something if, if you missed it. If you realize you didn't quite understand what happened in a previous paragraph, you can go back and review what you missed. But with spoken words, they just, they just disappear into thin air. We talk incredibly quickly and the words are gone as soon as, as soon as we say them. But wait, there's more. Often, when we're listening to speech, we have to do it in a background of extraneous competing speech or other forms of background noise. So think about listening to speech in a noisy restaurant. As another parallel to reading, it's like trying to read two sentences that are on top of each other. How hard would that be? You can't do that. And yet, that's the equivalent of what you're doing whenever you're listening to speech in a noisy restaurant. All right, so you know that line that people sometimes say, you never step in the same river twice? Because even if the thing is called the Cannon River both times, the water is different and the shoreline is eroded and, and you're different. Well, someone trying to be dramatic and make a point might also say, you never hear the same word twice. Because even if the word that you're hearing is canon every time, it's said at a different rate and with different intonation and with different co-articulation, depending on the words that come before it or after it. So the acoustic signal that actually reaches your ear is never exactly the same. So the question is, the thing that drives me and keeps me awake at night is, how are we pulling this off? How can we do this so well? If we have a task that is so cognitively and perceptually challenging, how is it that it feels like it's happening instantly and effortlessly? It makes sense that computers are bad at this task. We should be bad at this task. What's impressive is that we're so good at it. Dramatic trade noise right when I said that. So. How do we do it? Well, the first thing is that we don't have to rely on just that messy acoustic information alone. We can also use visual information about the talker. So I'm gonna play a clip where you're gonna hear babbly background noise like you're in a noisy restaurant, and then you will hear a woman start to read a passage. You'll hear that for a couple of moments, and then I'm gonna show you her face while she's talking. And I want you to notice how your perception of the speech changes when you can just hear her versus when you can hear her and see her as well. 4,000 years ago, just five miles north of present-day Thetford in the north of town of England, our Neolithic ancestors began what may have been the largest early industrial process. This is the site the Anglo-Saxons called Grime Graves. All right, it makes a big difference, right? The speech gets much easier to understand when you can see what she is saying as well as, as, well as hearing her. So a very robust finding in the spoken word recognition literature is that I see, being able to see the talker uh, significantly increases word identification accuracy. So this represents the accuracy with which people identify words presented in background noise via three mediums. Auditory, so just hearing alone, visual only, so just lip reading, and audiovisual. And you can see that audiovisual is by far the best. It's even better than the sum of audio only and, and visual only. So when we're seeing a talking face, we're getting bottom-up input about the speech sounds from the audio stream, but we can also see speech on the mouth. The mouth moves very differently depending on the speech sound that's being produced. So check this out. Ba, fa, the. You can see really different patterns uh, of how my lips and my tongue are visible depending on what I'm saying. So the visual signal contains enough information that it can supplement or complement the auditory signal, especially when the auditory signal is, uh, is degraded or noisy. Y you might almost say, no sense is an island. Another way we deal with the complexities of the bottom-up signal is to specialize for the words that we hear the most. So we've been talking about phonemes, the specific speech sounds of a language, and I said English has in the neighborhood of 47 of them. But these aren't the only sounds of human speech. So phones are the sounds that are used in any human speech, and there are many, many more of them than there are phonemes in English. So for instance, this is one phone that English does not use, but other languages do. There are also some phoneme categories in English that contain multiple phones. So for instance, there are two different phones for what we think of as a p sound. 
Uh, one is the p that's in spit, and one is the p that's in pit. Now you might say, those are both p sounds. Okay, so try this. Put your hand in front of your mouth and say spit, pit, spit, pit. You feel that there's that big burst of air when you say pit, but there's not a comparable burst of air for spit? Yeah, that's because you're actually pronouncing p differently depending on whether it's in spit or in pit. So English has some phoneme categories that actually contain two different phones. These are two t phones that English groups together, but some other languages, such as Hindi, distinguishes between them. Da, 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 da. So, a native, so as a native speaker of English, those sound very similar to me, and I would have trouble disambiguating them in running speech. But a native speaker of Hindi would have no trouble distinguishing between them. And it's very hard to distinguish between phones that aren't separate phonemes in your own language. A few years ago, I was in Norway visiting some family, uh, and I was, you know, trying to be cool and fun and learn some Norwegian. The word was radhuset, and I would say radhuset, and they'd be like, no, 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 that's way wrong, it's radhuset. And I would be like, what? That sounds the same. And we just went back and forth like this, and I kept saying, that's exactly what I'm saying. But the, the reason for this is that my native English speaker brain simply couldn't hear a phone contrast that the Norwegians were producing. So perception is clearly about more than just the stimuli that are present. What seems to happen is that we lose our ability to distinguish between phones that aren't important in our own language. Note that I say we lose the ability. That implies that we once had it. It appears that we are all born with the remarkable capacity for detecting differences between all phones, and we lose that ability over time. So we can't ask babies whether they can hear those differences directly, but we can get that information out of their adorable heads in some creative ways. So here's what we do. We play speech sounds for babies. They hear ba, 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 and then we change it to something like da. And every time the speech changes, we put something really interesting out in peripheral vision. Like here it is, it's like it's a bear playing a drum or something just fascinating. And the baby turns to look at it. So we do this a bunch and the baby learns that every time the speech changes, then they get to see that awesome bear doing something cool. So once they've learned that, we can play more subtle differences for them, like, t, like Hindi T1, 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 T2. And if they turn their heads to see the cool bear when it goes from T1 to T2, it signals that they have noticed a change. So here are the data showing a developmental progression of this. At about six months, babies raised in English-speaking households uh, detect the difference between the Hindi T1 and the Hindi T2 uh, most of the time. When they get a little bit older, they're somewhat less likely to notice that distinction. And by the time they're about a year, they rarely turn to look when it changes from T1 to T2, indicating they are no longer noticing that distinction. But if we look at babies raised in Hindi speaking households at that same age, so one of the ways that we deal with the messiness and complexity of speech is to specialize for the language that we are exposed to most. This is akin to what you read about with categorical perception. It's easier to perceive if we have fewer things we need to discriminate between. The downside of this is that it makes me harder for me to speak Norwegian. Some things people commonly ask about at this point. Uh, babies raised in bilingual households retain the ability to discriminate between all of the phonemes for both languages that they're being raised in. But research shows that you need to expose your children to actual real life speakers of the language in order for them to retain those phoneme distinctions. So if, for instance, I just play my kids lots of audiobooks of people speaking Hindi, it's not gonna let them maintain that distinction between T1 and, and T2. Okay, so visual information and phoneme pruning are two of the ways that we can overcome the challenges of speech perception via bottom-up mechanisms. But that's not all we can use. We can also use top-down information too. You read about the phoneme restoration effect in which missing speech sounds are filled in. So when you hear this... The state governors met with their respective legislatures <coughs> convening in the capital city. So one sound was removed and replaced with a cough. And probably you heard the cough, but can you tell me which sound was replaced? Yeah, people are generally pretty bad at figuring it out. They'll say it was somewhere in legislature, I don't know, and then they kind of guess which speech sound it was. But you know what the word was, and you know what the sentence meant, even though you can't figure out what bottom-up information was, was missing. So one of the reasons for this is that you know that legiblature and legiglature aren't words, and so you use your knowledge of lexical structure in English uh, to fill in the fact that even though you didn't hear the S in legislature, you know what that word was, was intended to be. So one way that we can overcome the difficulties of the bottom-up signal is by using lexical knowledge. 
we can also use our expectations based on semantics or, or meaning. So if I create a sound that is halfway in between b and p, and I put it in a word like she ran hot water for the path, uh, people typically interpret it in a way that makes it make sense with the, with the meaningful context. If instead I say she walked along the lovely garden path, uh, people will interpret that same exact sound as being path. So we use our expectations of what has come before in order to anticipate uh, the, the words that we're likely to hear. So our expectations can affect the sounds that we hear. There was a great demonstration of this that went viral a few years ago that shows just how much expectations affect perception. I'm going to play you a sound clip and I want you to first listen and try to hear the word brainstorm. <laughs> All right, now listen again to the same exact clip, but instead of hearing brainstorm, listen for green needle. It was the same clip, I promise. I don't ever lie to you. Okay, what I'm gonna do is put this on a loop and just decide each time whether you want to hear brainstorm or green needle and let it flip back and forth in your mind. How cool is that? All right, so what's going on here? Okay, the, the auditory input that we're getting is very messy and distorted. It's a low quality recording. It sounds grainy. It sounds uh, uh, really messy. Um, and when we have a really messy signal like that, we're very glad to rely on top-down information, to rely on our expectations, uh, to help overcome the shortcomings of the bottom of input. So by thinking of a particular word or phrase, you're priming yourself to expect it. You're looking for frequencies in the signal that are consistent with it. And so if you're expecting green needle, you're monitoring the frequencies that are most associated with that and vice versa for brainstorm. So this is a nice example of a case where uh, we're combining ambiguous bottom-up input with top-down expectation. This is an example of what we call a bistable illusion. So this is a stimulus that we can perceive in multiple ways depending on how we're focusing on it. So it's not unlike our logo for the class, the classic face vase, right? You can see two faces looking at each other or you can see a vase but you can't see both at, at the same time. Some illusions are truly bistable, as this one is. You can hear it both ways, and, and some are not. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. It's not the case that what you see is what you get. It's not the case that what you hear is what's actually there. Here's another great example of a bistable, ambiguous speech illusion. Yes, that sounds like an excellent idea. 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 Normally, I don't include swearing in my lectures, but oh, you know what? I'm not including swearing in my lectures. Grover is actually saying, yes, that sounds like an excellent idea. And the naughty words are all coming from your brain. So tisk tisk. Okay, so again, we have ambiguous input. That is, the bottom-up signal shares some features with both interpretations, and we're able to uh, we're able to to top down our way into either interpretation. So both Green Needle Brainstorm and Naughty Grover are bistable in that they can be interpreted in two ways, and most people can flip back and forth between hearing either. Of course, the most famous of these ambiguous auditory illusions is the following. Laurel. 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 What do you hear? Some people say Yanny, some people say Laurel. So this first came out in 2018 when a high school student working on a class project downloaded a recording of the word Laurel from vocabulary.com and was surprised when she opened it and it sounded to her like Yanny rather than Laurel. She shared it with some friends, it went viral, and the whole internet started to disagree with one another and start to notice that what we think we are hearing is only loosely related to the sounds that are actually present. So. The reason that it's bistable is that it can be interpreted in different ways. But unlike Green Needle and Brainstorm, which are bistable within individuals, this is bistable but across individuals. So it's kind of like an auditory analog to the dress, right? Some people hear it one way, some people hear it another way. Some people are able to flip back and forth or, or hear either, but most people kind of come down in, in one camp or the other. So there are two really interesting questions we can ask about this illusion. The first is, why is it bistable? Why is it possible to hear this in multiple ways, right? If I say cucumber, nobody heard octopus, right? That would never happen. So why is this word, why is this recording different? 
The second question is, why do individuals differ from one another in, in what they hear? Note that the question of who is right, what are they really saying, is not included as an interesting perceptual question. Perceptual psychologists aren't interested in who is right. What does that even mean? Your perceptual world is your own and it is correct. It's bi-stable because this is a low quality audio recording and the track contains frequencies that are consistent with both interpretations. There are frequencies there associated with Yanni and there are frequencies there associated with Laurel. So this is a spectrogram with a few different versions of the illusion. The original that you heard is, is in the middle in the red box. Now you can see that there is energy distributed between about 100 hertz and about 6,000 hertz in the normalish range of, of human speech. But the frequencies associated with Yanni are concentrated in a higher frequency region than those associated with Laurel. So both frequencies are there, but there's more Yanni energy in the higher frequencies and more Laurel energy in the lower frequencies. Now, even if you can only hear the original as either Yanni or Laurel, if we shift the pitch up or down, changing where that energy is associated with in each word often enables participants to, to hear the other interpretation. So here's the original one again. Laurel. Here's what it sounds like when the pitch is shifted down. So the energy associated with Yanni is now being presented at lower frequencies, at more Laurel-like frequencies. Yanni. Yanni. Yeah. And here's what happens if we shift it up. So the original Laurel frequencies are now being presented at a, at a higher Yanni like range. Laurel. 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 So most people report that with that shift, they can, they can hear the other interpretation. All right, so in this study, they selectively filtered the frequencies that were present to either emphasize the lower frequencies over here, so the, the, the higher frequencies are, are, the volume is turned down on those. So they're set up to be more Laurel-like over here. And over here, the low frequencies are turned down. So it's just the high frequencies that are really apparent. So it's more Yanni-like there. Um, and, and what you see from the, from the graph is that as the frequencies get higher pitched, people are less likely to perceive that as Laurel. When the low frequencies are present, they're more likely to perceive it as Laurel. But what's interesting from the graph is that there are some people that always hear it as Laurel and always hear it as Yanni, no matter, uh, no matter how the, the frequencies are shifted. So, so it is bi-stable because there is actually information that is consistent with both interpretations. So why are there individual differences? All right, so there are probably a few different things at play. One has to do with the nature of the device that listeners heard the recording on. Headphones and speakers filter the frequencies of sound in different ways. So cheaper or worse headphones, like earbuds, uh, filter out low frequencies, whereas better speakers can handle them. So if you're listening through headphones that don't present low frequencies well, you're more likely to hear Yanni because that's in the high frequency range. But that can't be the whole story because two people standing in front of the same speakers can still hear it differently. Another factor may be the hearing ability of listeners. So if listeners have worse hearing at the frequencies associated with Yanni, for instance, they're more likely to perceive Laurel. It may also have to do with expectations. When this first blew up, it was associated with vi this visual image. And so it may be that seeing the word Yanni first primed people to expect it and led them to hear it more often. So, so one really interesting thing about all of this is that once we have perceptually organized the information, that is, once we have interpreted the bottom-up signal in a meaningful way, it can be very difficult to perceive it differently. So as, as an example, as a, as a visual analog, if I ask you to tell me, uh, wh what, what is this a picture of? You probably can't tell. But once I help you perceptually organize it as a person riding a horse, now you can't unsee it right? I have changed that image for you forever. And you're always going to see that as a person riding a horse. Once you have made sense of that messy, ambiguous bottom up input, you kind of lock in that interpretation. All right, here, here's another example in the auditory domain. Here is a noisy sound. It's a person talking, but you're not going to be able to understand what they say. Now here's the same sentence, but with the speech made more clear. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. All right, now here's the first one that you heard, that noisy sound again. So once you have deciphered meaning, you, we tend to hold on to that meaning. So if you originally heard Yanni Laurel on speakers with poor representation of the low frequencies, so you perceptually organized to Yanni, you'll probably continue to hear that even on different speakers. All right, so to sum up, Speech is hard, or it should be hard, but somehow we're able to perceive spoken language in what feels like an effortless and instant way. 
And we do that because we have multiple sources of help other than just the messy acoustic signal. We can use bottom-up mechanisms like visual input and becoming more selective about the phonemes that we can perceive. And we can use top-down mechanisms like our knowledge of words in the language that we speak, semantic context, and the expectations that we have. As always, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I'll talk to you more in class. So this is a fun demo because it's pitting top-down information, that is what you are intending or setting out to hear, against a source of bottom-up information, the visual stimulus. My experience is that when I'm trying to hear the same thing as the mouth is conveying, it makes the experience stronger. But if I try to hear the opposite of the mouth, the top-down expectation overrides the visual effect. I'll be interested to hear what you think. I love this one. Isn't this delightful? Okay, so, so why might Molly have heard this? Okay, so it might be in part from bottom-up factors, right? There's some phoneme overlap, dreams, green, the, the, the two utterances sound somewhat similar. The listening conditions are somewhat difficult. There's music and other noise playing over the speech, and you can't see the talker's face. So you can't see how she's speaking in a way that would disambiguate red-green from wear dreams. In addition, uh, the, the misperceived words are semantically related to one another. Red primes green, they both prime tomato. Um, the actual words are also somewhat low probability, right? You may have heard of a concrete jungle, but where dreams are made of, those things are both semantically and, and grammatically uh, unusual. And so we take that somewhat messy input and organize it in a way that, uh, that, that, that fits more clearly with, with expectations. So after Yanni Laurel came out, there was a nice little flurry of studies of speech researchers trying to figure it out and trying to kind of uh, uh, tweak the effect and, and push it around a little bit. So here's what they found. Participants were more likely to perceive the speech as Laurel when low frequencies were emphasized and as Yanni when high frequencies were emphasized. No surprise there. Uh, down here in the graph, the blue, that is the sentence where the low frequencies were let through, shown down here. So when participants heard those low frequency sounds first, they were somewhat more likely to hear the stimuli as Yanni than when they were preceded by the high frequency sentence. This is somewhat akin to the demonstration of the fast and slow speaking rate for, for gab and gap. The same token is heard as being faster when the context is slower. Here, the same token is heard as being higher pitched when the context is, is lower pitched. So one reason this may happen is that you're primed with the high frequencies in this sentence, so the low frequencies are more emphasized. So what we are hearing is a function of individual differences, like we're each walking in our own perceptual world, and contextual expectations, like perception is an inference. So you may think, yeah, hearing speech is no big deal. I just hear the sounds and then I think of words. But in fact, what you think you hear depends on, in part, the acoustic input, but also what you are seeing of the talker's face, the visual input, the expectations you have about what that talker is likely to say, and the way that you have organized that information previously. Great talking with you. Next time, we'll talk about another complex form of auditory input, music.